Well, hello guys and welcome back to the channel. Now for something a little bit different, for this episode of our Simple Nightscape online workshop series, I'm out on location and I found this beautiful little stream, flowing water. I mean, what could be better than that? But you know, the subject for our episode this week is how to create and shoot and process simple star trails. And because I'm on location here, I'm gonna take you to a spot where I've shot star trails and run you through how we do that. Remember, this series is all about keeping it simple and I wanna make these videos straightforward and very easy to follow. Now I have done a few videos about star trials already on this channel, but there'll be a few differences in the way that I present this one today. It really is so easy to overcomplicate nightscape photography and it's my aim to not do that in this particular series. Now, that's a lot easier to say than to actually achieve. Don't forget that I still have my workshop program guide available for you to download from the link below. And as well as these shooting guides to keep in your camera bag. Now, these are designed as a reminder of camera settings while you're out in the field. And while you're on the website, you'll notice a PayPal link, which is there for those who have the capacity to help me out financially with this project. I wanna stress that this is non-compulsory and everything I'm producing here is completely free of charge. But if you'd like to help out, I will greatly appreciate that. Now, just one last thing, I'll be providing links for you to download raw files with each episode. And this gives you the opportunity to edit some of my images and to give you practice with the various software used. Now the subject of star trails is quite interesting. When I run my nightscape group workshops, I often have people who initially say they don't really like star trials. They've never really clicked for them and consequently haven't tried shooting them. Others see it as a priority and can't wait to get out to try them. Interestingly though, it's often the people who thought they didn't like them that actually get the most out of the exercise of shooting them. My feeling is that we're often influenced by someone else's opinion or experience, and when we finally have our own adventure under the stars, to shoot star trials, we often find it more fulfilling than we thought it would be. Now, I've mentioned this many times, but I'm of the strong opinion that we need to embrace our own adventures and experiences under the stars and not rely on what others may say or think about nightscape shooting. There's no such thing as a second-hand experience. Anyway, enough about all of that. I'd like to show you my very simple method of shooting star trials. I did intend to take you out under the stars and go through it in the field at night time, but the weather hasn't been behaving itself lately. So I've got another plan. What we'll be doing is looking at an image I shot quite some time ago, but the good thing is that I'll take you there now in the daylight to run you through how I went about it. So let's get out and get started. Okay, so here we find ourselves at the location of the shoot that I'd like to run through with you, this broken down old farm house. Now, since I was last here, when I actually did shoot these images, there was a little bit more of it standing. So that was a little while ago, but I'll still be able to run you through the basics of how we went about shooting this with star trails around the outside of the building. So let's get started. Okay, now just a little bit of background. Before I go to shoot anything, I think about the direction I'm going to face the camera. Now, because I wanted to shoot star trails at this location, and I wanted to get the circles of the star trails, to do that, I wanted to make sure I pointed south. Now, I'm in the southern hemisphere. For those of you living in the northern hemisphere, to get circular star trails, you need to point your camera north. And a lot of people say to me, well, how do I know exactly where that point in the sky is? I can tell you this, all you need is a compass and it will point you north. It doesn't have to be exact because you'll see very clearly in these images that the circles are massive. They're very, very big. Now, one of the things I do like to do though, however, is try and work out where the center of that um, circle would be in the sky and then compose my foreground so that it looks good. And in, in other words, it's balanced. And in this particular frame, I got my camera really low down. You can see it here. I got it quite low down to the, to the ground because I wanted to get a fair bit of sky 
Now, I've got the main part of the building over here on the right hand side and I worked out that due south was about there. So it's over the left hand part of the building. So the circles just went around there. And so I was happy with that composition. And I think composition, I've said to, to this to you many, many times before, composition is key to everything. So I spent quite a bit of time making sure I had my rough directions sorted out, get my camera angle where I want it to be, and work out where the building is going to be placed in the frame. Now, what camera equipment did I use for this shot? Okay, I've got my Nikon D750 here, fitted with the Nikon 14 to 24 f2.8. Now you can see it there. Now I had that set to 14 millimeters. So it's as, it's as wide a field of view as I can possibly get because I wanted to fit a lot in. You can see I'm pretty close to the building. Uh, I'm not, well, I, I guess if I stepped it out, I'd probably be about seven or eight meters to the closest part of the building. So, so that's good. And uh, one of the advantages of shooting with a very wide angle lens like this and a building that's fairly large is you can get back a little bit and still have everything in sharp focus. Now, focus is really critical for nightscape photography. I've, I've talked to you a lot about focusing, but in this case, all I need to do is focus to infinity. And to, the way to do that here is simply to focus on the building because I know that everything is gonna be in focus beyond about five meters away. And so that's pretty good. Now, another thing that helped that, I stopped the aperture down on this lens to f3.5 it's just a little bit and when you're shooting star trials i'm going to explain this a bit later but you can often stop down the lens a little bit it doesn't have to be wide open so that brings kit lenses in maybe f4 kit lenses things like that you can successfully shoot star trials with just about any lens at all now as far as settings are concerned you can see i've got the camera here at f2.8 i'll put the camera into bulb mode so on most cameras, you'll find bulb mode after a 30 second shutter speed. And the reason I've got it in bulb mode is because I want to shoot longer than 30 second exposures. Now, you'll notice here, I've also got the ISO set to 640, and uh, that's a pretty good medium ISO, not too high, not too low, and that works out really well with this camera and this lens combination. Okay, now I'm sure one of the obvious questions you're going to ask me is how do I work out the shutter speeds and how do I know how long I need to expose to get those star trials to come out? Well, it's really simple because once you start elongating your shutter speed, you will soon immediately notice trailing of the stars. Now, when you're shooting nightscapes, generally, you don't want star trailing, so you have to limit your shutter speed. But when you're shooting star trails and with the intention of capturing star trails, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to actually capture the, the trails. So what I like to do is lengthen my shutter speed right out. And I found a pretty happy medium to be about three minutes. So that's what I did here. I set my camera. Now, you'll soon find out that the camera only goes to 30 seconds. So I had to use an external intervalometer. And with something like this, now this is only a, about a $25 piece of equipment, not expensive at all. You can get them to fit just about any camera. There are the odd cameras on the market that will go longer than 30 seconds, but I don't know of any that go to three, well, there might be one or two, but not many will go beyond about 60 seconds. So I like to go to about three minutes. Now I've done five minute exposures, I've done 10 minute exposures. Uh, no problem at all, but three minutes I find to be a good balance between a lack of noise um, and I can drop the ISO because I'm shooting a long shutter speed. That cleans up everything. And I can also drop the aperture a little bit, which I explained before, and that makes the image even sharper. So all of these factors combined make, I think, for an excellent image. So what I did, I shot three minute exposures at F3.5, ISO 640, and I shot 10 of them. Now you might ask, well, why 10? Well, the reason I could shoot longer than 10, no problem. Um, 10 gives me a, a, a enough to see the star trailing and the beautiful circles. That's only a total of 30 minutes of exposure. But I'll tell you what, that is all you need, especially when you're facing towards the South Pole. Okay, so I'm sure your next question is gonna be, well, how on earth do you set these things up? So what you find is they have a delay long interval N, which means number, and a little uh, music note there. So if you look at this, you can see that I've got a, a 
the little line there is under delay. I've got a two second delay. It doesn't have to have a two second delay, but I just decided that it would work a little bit better with just a short delay in the program. Then I'm going to long. So long is the shutter speed. So three minutes, so it's hours, minutes, and seconds. So you can see there, I've got zero, 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 three, zero, zero. That means three minutes, quite simple so far. Move along by pressing the arrow, and this is the interval. Now, this is really simple, and I wish every intervalometer inbuilt in cameras had this. I've got a one second interval. That's all I want, just a one second between each shot. And the reason I don't want any longer is because I don't want any gaps in the star trials. Okay, so we move to the next parameter, and that gives you a number. That might be hard to see with the reflection, but I've got 10 selected. Now, if I press set, it starts flashing. I can make that 11 or 12 or 13 or whatever. It's not limited to 10, but I use 10 as a happy medium in this particular case. And we go along to the next one, and that's just got that little music note. Now, I get really annoyed with the thing beeping, so it gives you the option to actually turn it on or off. So I always have that turned off. And that's exactly how the intervalometer works. It's quite a simple device. Now, to get it started, to begin the sequence, all we do is tap this timer, start, stop button. And to finish the sequence, if you want to finish it before it ends, you press that same button again. Otherwise, you just let it go through until we get to the end of our exposures. Now, one other very important factor that I'd like to mention is how would I light this? Now, of course, you could shoot this with no lighting at all and just have the foreground in silhouette. But hey, that's not what I like. I much prefer to light my nightscape images somehow. So remember, this is all about being simple. So what I did in this particular case, and what I'd probably advise you to do also, is to use one of those three minute exposures just to put some light into your shot. And you know, the funny thing is it doesn't matter which one. So in this case, I think I did the very first exposure, but you could do the last one, you could do one in the middle, it really doesn't matter. So how did I light it? Well, I got my LED lenser P7.2 torch, which I've showed you many, many times in the past, just this little flashlight. And what I did, I moved over to the right hand side here and lit that side of the building. Then I moved around the back of the camera. Well, it's, remember, it's still exposing at this point, so this is one shot. And I just did a little bit of lighting on the left hand side. So effectively what I've got is cross lighting. I'm lighting from both sides, but I am not lighting from this angle. And I'll tell you what, when you light bricks, like what's on that building over there, on the side angle, you get this gorgeous tone with the mortar lines, and I love that. And also on this side, you can see there's a lot of old rubbish and, and things laying on the ground there. Once again, get the light down low on an angle, and that looks superb. Now, you're probably thinking, how long do you light your subject? And it's really difficult for me to tell you exactly how long you need to light your subject for. There's so many factors that come into it. How bright is their light source? How far are we away from the subject matter? And, and how long do we leave the light on there? All of those factors come into play. Um, so it's just trial and error. Now, what I would suggest you do is do a test shot before you start these exposures. Do one image at three minutes, set your camera and everything up, then do some lighting and just see how it looks. If you think you've put too much light in, then do a little bit less. It's not rocket science, it's just trial and error, but it works pretty well. So as you can see here, lighting the bricks from the side gives you a far better result than lighting them front on. It doesn't matter what it is you're lighting, that's my method and I think it works every time. All right, so hopefully that's helpful to you. Look, the weather's really poor at the moment. It looks like rain coming from over there. So I'm going to get back and get a little bit of shelter, but I hope that helps you work out the actual camera settings and the actual composition and layout when you're actually on site. Okay, so hopefully that makes a lot of sense to you. Now, I'd like to show you how I edit these images into the final shot. Today, I'll be using both Lightroom and a free program called StarStacks to edit these images. Let's get into the computer. Now with all my editing, I like to begin my images in Lightroom. You can see Lightroom here. This is the first image in my stack. I've got 10 
down the bottom here. Now the first one is the one I light painted. So you can see the lighting on the building, a little bit of lighting from this side. So as I explained out in the field, I lit that from both angles, but not from the direction of the camera. Now this is a three minute exposure. You can see the 183 seconds, f3.5, 14 millimeter focal length at ISO 640. You can see I've done a little bit of adjustments already to these images just to save time. And you can see I've dropped the highlights, increased the whites, not much else up here at all. Go right down to um, noise reduction, plus 20 luminance, plus 20 contrast. And I've adjusted both of these, ticks both of these boxes, remove chromatic aberration and enable profile corrections. I want to show you a couple of things. Firstly, let's just zoom in on this section of the sky here. And you can see there are definitely little trails of the stars. Now, this is only three minutes. I mentioned to you that if you went longer, they'd be longer trails. But the thing I want to draw your attention to is the different colors here. People often talk about colors of stars. You can see this is yellow, blue, a little bit of uh, a less of a yellow and a white. Uh, so there's definitely, you can see them all through here. As I go through, you can see different colored stars. Now, this one here is blown out. And what a lot of people do is blow their star trails out so they lose the colors. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention because uh, these images are, are not blown out. They're shot, well, obviously, you know, they're shot at uh, a low ISO of 640. And that helps uh, tremendously in, in maintaining the color. Now, what I did, uh, rather than edit each image individually, I just uh, held down shift on the keyboard and clicked on the last one. And then I just press sync here. When you press sync and you make sure all of these are checked, and then you press synchronize. And what that does, it, it copies all of the settings across from one image to the other. And so I've already done that. Uh, and you can see if I, if I happen to look at any of these other ones. Oh, and by the way, this one here, there's a meteor went shooting through. Have a look at that. Isn't that just beautiful? So that's that was the luck of the draw. I mean, you, you never really know what you're going to get. But uh, I can look at any of these images and you can see um, each one individually and you can see there as I move through them how the stars are actually moving and they're moving around this center point here anyway so what I'm going to do here is just re-select all of those images I'm going to go up to file export and what this brings is my export dialog box and what I'm going to do here is export these to the folder I've chosen. I'm going to call them Star Trail TIFFs. Now, what I'm going to do is export these as TIFF files. A TIFF file is uh, a type of file format that is not compressed. So it's a very high quality image. Now, I could send them out as JPEGs. Uh, I don't want to do that because a JPEG is a compressed file format. So what I do here, I press export, and that just sends those out to a folder. Now, uh, I'm going to use a program called StarStacks in a minute. Now, the reason I'm sending these out of Lightroom is because Lightroom does not create star trails. I need to use another piece of software. Now, I usually use Photoshop because I can do more in Photoshop, but that's a little bit more complex. And I want to show you the simple way of editing star trails. So let's go and have a look at star stacks now for some of you you may have never heard of star stacks so let's just go and google it uh, star stacks and we'll see what we get now here it is this is the website this is where you download the program now it's completely free so all you need to do is press download and installation it doesn't take very long to do that so star stacks that's what it's called it's a free program and it works really really well so what I'm going to do now is open Star Stacks. I've got it on my desktop here. So here we go. That's what it looks like when you first open it up. Now, it's pretty intuitive, but the first thing that you do is you just go to this very first little icon here, click on it, and it says Open Images. So it's open to the folder because I had this open before just to make sure it was in the right spot to all the images I just created. There they are. There's my 10 Star Trails. TIFF files. So I'm going to highlight all of those and press open. Now, you're probably asking me, why, why don't you just go straight to StarStacks rather than go to Lightroom? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, StarStacks doesn't work with RAW files uh, and I shoot in RAW file format. Now, 
Of course, you can shoot in JPEG, but I would highly recommend you don't shoot JPEG because JPEG is a compressed file format, as I mentioned before. And what we want to do is, is have our highest quality possible images, especially for these nightscapes. Things like noise reduction and all these other things, we need to be able to apply them somewhere. And Lightroom is fantastic for applying those adjustments uh, that I did before. But anyway, here we are, go. We've got our 10 images in here. It's showing the first one at this point in time. Then we go over here. Now, there's a couple of different blending options here. I'm going to leave it on Lighten. There are some other ones in here. There's Gap Filling, Darken, Subtract, Multiply, all these things. But Lighten is the one that I'm going to use. I'm not going to check, check any of these other boxes. Just leave it simple because that's what this video is all about. And then I'm going to go over here. Now, this icon up the top here is the one that you click to start processing, as it says there. So I'm just going to click it and see what happens. And you can see there, it took about uh, 10 seconds to process that, and it's created our star trail. Have a look at that. With our, all, our little meteor shooting through the middle there. So it looks fantastic. So to save that from the program, I just go to File, Save As, and it will send it to the file. Well, I've got to tell it where to go. So I'm just gonna open up the folder where I want it to go. And um, well, it's already given it a name, so I'll just leave it at that. And I'll click Save. And okay, it says it's the image is saved. So let's go and have a look at it. So I'll just open up the folder where it is. If I can just find it, here we go. Um, D drive over here and here. So I just open up the file and there are all the TIFF files. And on the end is our JPEG image. You can see it there, it's an 11 megabyte file. It's quite a large one, which is a high quality. Double click so you can have a look at it. There you go, there's our image. And that looks pretty good. And it didn't take much effort to create that. So this is a very simple and easy way of creating star trails using Lightroom and star stacks. Okay, so there you go. Hopefully that takes the mystery out of shooting simple star trail images. You know, I'll be really keen to get your feedback down below in the comments. And don't forget to download the free guide and raw files also listed down below underneath this video. Okay, well, we're off and running now, and I'll be working on another nightscape photography topic this coming week. So make sure you tune in next time, and we'll see what we can come up with. All right, well, you guys have a fantastic week, and I'll look forward to seeing you then. See you later.